Hi, this is Roger, and we're going to continue with part two of the Armory Show. The Americans tried to make the show about innovations in American art in modernism by having 70% of the exhibition be American pieces. But when it was all said and done, 70% of what was sold was European. One out of three European pieces on display were sold, and that compared to one out of 17 of the American pieces selling. That's roughly 6%. 87,000 people attended in New York, 180,000 attended in Chicago, and 13,000 saw the scaled-down show in Boston. One of the pieces that did sell was by Paul Cezanne, and it was painted in 1877, roughly 35 years before the show. It was bought by the Metropolitan Museum, and I think one of the reasons they wanted it is that they'd had decades to see what Cezanne's development and his impact was on what's happening in, or had happened in Impressionism, post-Impressionism in early modern art. This painting of Domaine St. Joseph, also known as the Poor House on the Hill, illustrates many of his distinctive methods you can see that he's giving a lot more definition with his brush stroke than many of the Impressionists did. He applies some interesting technique in that he is not using conventional shadows. Additionally, he's very deliberate in allowing the canvas to peek through, which you're going to see again when we get to Matisse. When we have our class Zoom, I'll be curious to see what the artist on the call have to say about the bathers. Cezanne's bathers are revered by artists all over the world. Picasso owned one of them and he took it wherever he went. So I'll be curious to see what your take is on why this particular series of paintings, the variety of bathers that Cezanne did, have had such long, long standing impact. While Cezanne was a bit of a loner, the Duchamp brothers were from a very large and artistically driven family. The Duchamps were among the stars of the show. It could be in large part because there were three of them. It was also because they had a large exhibition space. How? Well, they befriended Walter Pock, one of the organizers of the show, and he was living in Paris the year before the event. The three brothers were Marcel Duchamp on the left, in the middle is Jacques Villon, and on the right is Raymond Duchamp Villon. So how do three brothers have three different last names? It was largely due to Jacques Villon having an idea that when he and Raymond were in art school, he decided he would distinguish himself by coming up with a new name, Villon. His older brother took his lead and became Duchamp Villon. The work that you see on the lower right is one of the Raymond Duchamp Villon sculptures. You can see it has very modernist feel. It's archaic in terms of the period of portraiture, but it has the angularity in the large planes that give you quite a sense of mass and modernity. It's a most impressive piece. You don't hear much about him because he died just five years after the show. Now, Brother Jack painted the girl in the piano. He and Raymond were the two forces behind what became known as the Puteau Group, which is named after the suburb where the two were living. They may, the name evolved and morphed into Orphism, and among their group were the Delaney's, Sonia and Robert. Uh, Franzik Kupka and also Ferdinand Leger were also associated with them. You're going to see a prominent amount of that style of cubism at this event. Here's the cause salab, the big controversial piece, the nude descending the stairs by Marcel Duchamp. For those of you familiar with Georges Braque and Pablo Picasso's cubism, you may notice that the nude is not that style. It is also not in the specific style of Orphism or the Puteaux group, 
which Duchamp's brothers had formed. It's more planar and faceted, faceted being a term often used in describing certain cubist works, but then again, this isn't exactly a cubist work, as we'll explain. How did he get the idea? Duchamp was likely familiar with Edward Mybridge in his studies of motion created using successive photo images. After first recording a horse in motion, he addressed humans. On the right, he captured the nude woman walking up and down stairs. Mybridge's method was built on the work of Etienne Jules Marais. The lesser known Marais invented chrono photographic gun, which recorded 12 successive images via a rotating shutter onto a gelatin-based film. Got it? His human motion studies use reflective lines attached to the model's clothing, as you see on the left. If you think about it, Marais's method is the precursor to the way film animators capture action and how some of the golf swings are analyzed and video games are made. The futurists weren't in the show because they had already committed a large amount of their collections to other exhibits, and as a result, they didn't participate. This Giacomo Bala is at the Albright Knox in Buffalo, New York. It's adorable how he chooses to show the dog's movement with the way that they're capturing the dog on a leash. The painting on the right is by Umberto Boccioni, and it hangs at MoMA. It is in the spirit of cubism with a lot of motion going on. The futurist was an Italian artist and writer's group which was focused on speed, motion, and abandoning the past. At this time, Picasso was producing what has been termed analytical cubism. It is illustrated by his standing nude, which you see here. While it's two-dimensional, he's trying to capture her in the whole. If you were to look into the shadows and crosshatching, you'll see that he has captured her various body parts. The attention that was driven by Marcel Duchamp's nude and other pieces was not exactly cubism along the Brock Picasso lines. However, to the broader audience, cubism covered a wide span. We may know that there are some subtleties in between the different types, but for most viewers, it all counted as cubism. A quick metaphor for that is that when flat screen TVs first came out, Everyone considered them high-definition TVs. The reality was, no, they weren't necessarily high-definition. The smaller ones just happened to use a type of technology, LCD technology, which allowed the TV sets to be flat. But to most people, they were all called high-definition. Same thing here with cubism. Anything close to being cubist is cubism. Here you see the Chicago Daily News piece where the day before, the newspaper had questioned if anyone could locate the woman or any stairs in the painting. One of the show's backers, Chicagoan and major purchaser, Jerome Eddy, responded by outlining, proclaiming, there she is. Now, we don't hear much about Picasso at this event, other than a little stir about his woman with mustard jar and one sculpture. That's in large part because the people the people that put on the show, Davies, Pock, and Kuhn, were a little more fond of the Pateau Orphis style with their bright colors and implied motion than Picasso and Brock. Also, Picasso's works were dispersed around the show. He did not receive any singular focus. By contrast, there were dedicated areas for Redon, Matisse, and the Duchamps. One of the Picassos was a traditional portrait of Madame Solar. Interesting to bring up because there are issues regarding its ownership, and it's still in the courts today. The family that originally owned it sued the Bavarian government in Munich for its return. The family had been forced to forfeit the works to gain safe passage out of pre-World War II Germany. They were successful in recovering four other works. This piece continues to be 
in the courts. Here are two more Picassos. I've included the sculpture alongside the woman with mustard jar because his oil rendering of the head is similar to the one the Art Institute of Chicago displays adjacent to their Cubist paintings. This Brock, Mozart's violin, illustrates Cubism. It's especially noteworthy since it includes its own pun. Mozart, of course, had art as part of his name. The Polish violinist Kublik had a name which was mispronounced by non-Polish speakers as Kubik. While Kublik performed Mozart's compositions at a very well-attended 1912 event, which is where the idea for this came from. Here is another action-packed Villon on the left. We can compare it to the Alfred Glisé on the right. Each work reflects a dynamism that fits with more of what we consider to be the orphism, color, and circular forms, and angularity. Francis Picabia is also grouped with the others. His works are another cube-like variant. Can you see the two figures dancing? The one that is closer to us on the right is a woman since she has breasts. Her male dance partner, the man, is on the left. And you can see the woman's leg and foot passing in front of him. This dynamic work is at Philadelphia Museum of Art. As we referenced earlier, one of the stars of the exhibition was symbolist Odeon Ridon. He's the artist that Walter Pock saw at The Hague in the Netherlands and decided to promote. To the right is the head of Orpheus, and on the left we have silence. Ridon created thoughtful, ethereal, and seemingly spiritual art high imagination, dreamy types of work. Are any of you thinking that sounds a lot like what surrealism is going to become? Well, you're absolutely right. Redon had this mystical, magical feel to what he painted. So here are two more Redones. Both are in Texas. What I think is so clever about the one on the right is that he created a faux fresco look for this piece, which if you weren't looking very carefully, you really would think it was a fresco. Now, when we get online, I'll be curious to see what all of you think about Redone's style. And in particular, I'm curious as to what your take might be on why we don't see and hear more about Odeon Redone. I wonder whether it has something to do with the fact that he largely did pastels and his works were small. So they wind up in carefully controlled lighting and they also are not that often seen in big splashy shows. I don't know if that's the answer, but I'll be curious to see what all of you think. Now, Edward Monk had a strong presence at the Armory Show. Several of his works were combinations of lithography and woodcut at the same time. To the left is a work many of us have seen and known as Madonna. This version has what appears to be little sperms floating around. And then on the lower left, an image of some sort of fetus zygote. It's creepy, and that's probably his intent. What do you think? Just to confuse matters, this is a work where Monk created five versions of it in oils. Only the one we see had the little skeleton and spermicides floating around. For some of the print versions, he used two printing stones, and finally for some, he added a woodcut impression to add additional texture. Now, just to complicate matters, to add to this mix, the work is known by some as the loving woman and not Madonna. How does the loving woman title affect your reading of the painting? Now, how do you feel about the artist creating multiple versions around a central figure? 
Some make spot-on duplicates, while others, like Monk, are known for their close but not quite the same variants, where each piece that comes off, while it's a duplicate, it isn't a replica, if that makes sense. Uh, how about the two very different titles? For those artsy folks in the class, we can also compare what Monk did to Cezanne, Monet, and Picasso, where they did repetitive themes. For some, the work on the right is known as Vampire II. What comes to mind if I tell you that the title on the museum wall instead is Love and Pain. So what do you read into the work if you see that title? Does it connote a different emotional feeling? That'll be, again, something worth discussing. How do you consider these two pieces with one name versus the other name. Now for a more cheerful series of works. Henri Matisse is the master of upbeat and cheerful. His large showing related to his fame and also his relationship with Walt Pack. We're fortunate to have this grainy image of how the Matisse area was hung at the show. We see three of his major works in the picture, Le Lux II, The Blue Nude, and The Red Room. He attracted a lot of attention, especially the blue nude with her coloring and the overall modeling of the form which upset viewers. Matisse was someone who had been displayed for a number of years at Alfred Stieglitz's 291 Modern Modernist Gallery in New York. However, the wider populace would not be familiar with Matisse, which helps explain the tremendous and often negative attention he received at the Armory Show. The Red Studio was a big to-do, in particular for artists. As we covered in an earlier talk, he knew how to paint in proper perspective, but he chose to flatten this treatment. As you ponder his possible rationale, let us consider this interpretation of his compositional plan. We might enter the picture from the lower right and move our way up to the left and then across and back down again. Okay, so what's going on is that even though it's still flat, we do get a certain sense of depth because of the overlapping. He implied perspective through the ascending and seemingly receding height of some of the objects in the upper center and right. One intimates a sense of depth, even though Matisse is not following Bruno Lesci's method of how to draw perspective. There's no test on this. Just think about it for a second and enjoy looking at the arrows as they lead your eye around. What impact did Henri Matisse have on future generations of artists? Mark Rothko said he felt he was channeling Matisse as he evolved into his own mature style. To the right is another fan, Andy Warhol too was quoted as saying he wished he could have been Matisse. Frank Stella, the artist in the center, said, I'm making abstracts out of Matisse. While the Andy Warhol piece is up on the right here, 14 pictures at a car crash, I'd like to make another armory show connection. Warhol actually met Marcel Duchamp. And supposedly Duchamp said, and I paraphrase the probable, apocryphal, possible, maybe it happened meeting, having the 14 pictures of a car crash is not the art. Having the idea of having 14 pictures of a car crash made into an artwork, that is where the creation takes place, not in the execution. Now, let's look at another innovator. Vasily Kandinsky is often attributed with leading the move towards non-representational art. There was a very innovative Kandinsky on display at the show. This one actually had a title, Improvisation 27, and a subtitle, Garden of Love, which falls a little outside the artist's usual convention of just using musical notational titles. This work includes more visible figuration than other works 
of the early 20th century. The Garden of Love subtitle refers to multiple scenes of embracing in the work. When we zoom, let's see if we can identify them. I also would like to point out that this piece is from 1912. At the very beginning, you saw Meneer Dawson, a Chicago artist who had a non-representational abstract work from 1911. We'll talk about that too. Sculptor Constantine Brancucci was another Walter Pock Paris connection. His kiss on the right has carried much influence through the years. He chiseled a few versions of this. This one actually was quite small, but it was impactful as it is. It was a piece of limestone that was directly carved or directly cut is the expression they use. That became very important in terms of the sculpting movement. Brancucci inspired two major 20th century sculptors, Dame Barbara Hepworth and Sir Henry Moore. Miss Hepworth used gray alabaster and Henry Moore used green hornet stone, which he whittled down in a carving and cutting fashion. So this is some of the effect of what you had increasing Brancucci's notoriety. Was the show a success? As I mentioned earlier, Americans were 70% of the units on display and roughly 30% of the sales, with one out of 17 selling. The Europeans were a third or 30% of the units on display and approximately 70% of the sales, and they sold one out of three European works. After the show, many American artists experimented with more modern style, but most reverted to their earlier initial methods. The Americans that stuck with being modernists had already begun as modernists. Joseph Stella and Charles Sheeler come to mind. They were already in the mode of being modernist, and then they stuck with it. One of the biggest advantages that came out of the show was that there were now between one and two dozen new galleries opening, including the Daniel Montrose and the Folsom in New York, in addition to the two that had already existed before the big event. The largest buyers in the show were Mrs. Lily Bliss, Jerome Eddy, Walter Arensberg, and John Quinn. Each of their collections were bequeathed to major institutions. The Bliss to MoMA, Part of the Quinn and Arnsberg Trust landed in Philadelphia, and the Jerome Eddy Collection joined the Art Institute of Chicago. I wanted to highlight a few more pieces on our way uh, to the finish line here. Uh, Stella is an example of someone who started modern, as you see on the left, and then a few years after the show, you see, with his vision, he continued to stay in very much of a modern mode. Stuart Davis, he did change. And you see here on the left, he was a student of Robert Henry, and he did this immigrant scene in the style of the urban realist. However, after the show, he evolved into his new style very definitely modernism, kind of collage looking uh, in the way he did things, but certainly very modern. A few final questions for our call. Why more European sales than American? What do you account for the big Cezanne sale? Was the Vian Duchamp brothers success due to there being three of them? How do you describe the nude? Why do you think Matisse burned an effigy? And why do you think Radon was a star? And why do you think we just don't hear that much about him? See you on the call.